Hi friends, day 207 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi, welcome to Bible study. And if you've been here, same old drill, like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, make sure you're in our Facebook group. Today we are still in the book of Isaiah and this is a couple of my favorite chapters from this book because so many promises come out of here. And I remember that it was through this book, through these chapters, where God really restored my heart in so many ways when I was having a tough time or when I was going through some trials and going through my own restoration. So let's pray before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another day. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for choosing us to be able to be your children in this lifetime, in this day, for such a time as this. Lord, you have given us a very specific calling and purpose on our life. I pray that if that has not been revealed to your children yet, God, that you will let them know what that is, that you'll show them the steps on what they need to do next, and that you will allow them to be led by you, to be guided by you. And I pray, God, that they will continue to keep their eyes open, their ears turned toward you so that they're able to hear your voice and, and see your leading through it all. I thank you for this time together as family. Thank you for this group, every person who is here to read today, whether they are here for the first time or they are jumping in sporadically or they have been here since day one. Lord, you know exactly where they are on their journey and you have brought them here for a purpose. It is not by accident. So we are trusting you in this time to speak to our hearts. So I pray that we are open for that today and please forgive us of our sins, Lord, as we also are able to forgive those who have hurt us and who have come against us. Please reveal to us anything that we might need to make right, whether it is within our own hearts or something that we might be holding against another person. Help us to make it right so we can then come to you with clean hands and a pure heart. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we left off with God giving the people correction. He convicted their hearts. And now we move into the phase of the comfort that he is going to give to his people. And this is what is known as the gospel according to Isaiah. You know how we have the gospel according to Mark, Matthew, Luke, John. This has been called the gospel according to Isaiah because of the way that it prophesies to the coming of Jesus and who he is for his people. Comfort, comfort, oh my people. So this is, let me bring you the end of suffering. And when he says my people, this is declaring his covenantal relationship with him. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem or to the exiles and cry to her. So he is preaching. Isaiah is speaking this message to broken hearts, to those who have been exiled to Babylon. And anytime we preach to those who might have broken hearts, then we will never be without an audience because the world is full of brokenness, who, of people who need Jesus. And now he is calling them to be a witness that her warfare is ended. The warfare being that servitude that they were spending in Babylon or giving in Babylon, that her iniquity is pardoned. Now, he is giving us reasons for the comfort of God. God said, I'm going to bring you comfort, and here are his reasons. He needed to bring comfort because they were living in their sin, and he is now offering that forgiveness that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This term double is the same term for if you were to fold a piece of paper in half and fold it over on itself, and you would have two equal sizes. So it means equivalent. So basically, he has given her forgiveness for the sin that she committed or the right amount of forgiveness. Her debt has been paid. And this is pointing to Jesus. The fact that when Jesus died for us, the battle was won. Jesus forgave our sins. Our iniquities were pardoned. Our debts also were paid. And now we see this sort of essence of ministry, the purpose of ministry. A voice cries in the wilderness, so the wilderness, being the barren places, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. So when we say prepare the way for the Lord, this means clear out all of the obstacles. And this highway is referring to the hearts of the people that are prepared for revealing the glory of God. And how do we do this? How are we able to prepare the way? Well, we have to focus on him, first of all. But in these next two verses, we are given very specific things to do. Every valley shall be lifted up. So every deep, dark place, depression, defeat, it'll all be lifted up. 
So we have got to get up, get yourselves up and out of the valley. Every mountain and hill be made low. So pride, prayerlessness, anything that is being held above standard is to be brought low. We've got to humble ourselves before the Lord. The uneven ground shall become level. So any errors have got to be straightened out and made right. So we've got to repent. And the rough places, a plain. So anything that has been sort of like an irritation or sandy or rocky has ne- it needs to be made smooth. So we have got to now file down. After we repent, we've got to do a little bit of sanding, some fine tuning. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall, shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And the way that the glory of God was revealed is through restoration of the captives. It's ultimately fulfilled when Jesus returns, of course. So this is all about preparation. God is big on preparation. And this preparation will then lead to getting into the word. We start by preparing our heart so that we are able to receive the word. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. So this is referring to the frailty of man or its fleeting glory. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. And the reason why it withers and fades is because of God's judgment, his wind, that scorching wind that will blow, that will make the grass wither and the flower fade. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. So Peter refers to this scripture when he speaks about the seeds that are planted into our hearts and how the word of God is like an incorruptible seed and his word truly never changes. It's reliable, it is stable, it's eternal, and it's permanent. So When we think about the word and the seeds, the incorruptible seeds, those reliable seeds, the stable eternal seeds that have been planted in our hearts, which ones have been planted in your heart? What seeds, what promises are you clinging to? Now, if you don't have something yet, if you could say, shoot, I don't know, I don't really have any verses yet, haven't memorized anything. It's not about memorizing, but it's about knowing the essence of God. You may not know where the scripture is, but you know sort of what it says. For me, it's things like, he who started a, a work within you will be faithful to complete it. You know, he will never leave you or forsake you. The gifts of God are without repentance. Those are the kind of scriptures that I pull out of my heart whenever I start to feel doubtful or my faith or my hope starts to dim a little bit. I reach into my heart for those seeds. And this is why it's so important for us to study, to write things down, to write things real big when they stick out to us, because that is when we are truly going to be able to plant the seed into our heart. It's one thing for it to fall into our heart or the soil of our heart, but it's another thing for that soil to be fertile and ready to be planted. So go on up to a high mountain, O Zion. So the remnant is what he's referring to here. Herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not, says, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Now this is sort of our mission here is to study our God so that we are able to then be a witness for God, that we are able to go out and tell the word, behold your God. This is the work of an evangelist that we are speaking of here. And evangelist, I believe, comes from a word that actually speaks of people who would go from city to city selling soap. And it is spiritually looked at in the sense that When we preach the word of God or share the word of God, we are essentially offering soap to cleanse the sinner. And because God has come to rescue, that is the good news. He has brought his son Jesus to this earth to die for our sins. What great news for us that we get to live eternally when we receive him and we have that payment for our sins. So if we don't know the word, if we don't know God ourselves, how are we ever going to be able to be that witness? Well, the question is here, since you're here in this Bible study, and I'm assuming a lot of you go to church, when you leave your church, when you walk away from this Bible study, do you truly know God a little bit more? Do you understand his character more? Do you walk away knowing his heart more? Do you walk away from it feeling as though he has changed you for the better? He calls them to behold their God, but also behold the Lord God comes with might and his arm, which always signifies his strength, 
his might and also his judgment and deliverance. His arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him. Reward is typically the spoils of victory. Well, of course, Jesus is victorious. The battle is won. And so he also comes with a reward. When he returns a second time, he will come with reward and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. So he will give them this special care. He will gather the lambs in his arms. So he will lift them up with strength and carry them tenderly. He will carry them in his bosom. So giving them this safe and tender place and gently lead those that are with young. So isn't this beautiful, this picture of the shepherd in the way that he cares for us? It isn't his wrath and his anger and his judgment. No, he is like a shepherd to us in the way that he lifts us up and carries us and gently leads us. Because truly, Holy Spirit is a gentleman and he is going to gently lead you. He isn't going to whip you around like you know, a, a puppet or some kind of rag doll. He is going to kind of nudge you and You know, his hope is that you will listen to that nudging. So now we go from shepherd to now looking at him as our creator. But first, let's stop here at the different ways that Jesus is referred to as the shepherd. He is referred to in John chapter 10 as the good shepherd, meaning that he cares and he sacrifices for his flock. He's also referred to as the great shepherd in Hebrews 13, showing his glorious triumph over the enemy. And then the chief shepherd in 1 Peter chapter 5, the fact that he is shepherd over all people, not just Israel. And it also speaks of him and how he will divide the sheep from the goats. He will divide the believers from the unbelievers, from the true followers, uh, from the religious ones whose heart aren't, you know, hearts aren't set on him. So now we look at his creation. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, a span being a hand breadth. So from the thumb to the pinky finger, that is considered a span. And that's how the Lord has measured. So imagine how huge his hand is. If you really think about how huge the the universe is and the heavens, think about how big the hand of God is. Enclose the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? So when it says what man shows him his counsel, it's like, Who are we to tell the creator of the universe what to do with our lives? But many times we do. We will pray and be like, Lord, I need you to X, Y, and Z. So heart check. Do you ever try to counsel the Lord? Do you try to tell him how he needs to run your life? Guilty. Been there. Done that. Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? So this is essentially asking the main question, who is the creator? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket because no nation really can thwart the plan of God and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel. All the wood in the world, which a lot of the wood came from Lebanon, it's known for its trees and its forests. Well, all the wood in the world would not be enough for any sacrifice. Our best efforts basically will never satisfy and honor God. Because again, we're not saved by works, but by his grace. Nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. And therefore, we don't have to fear. You know, when we start to hear about nations rising up and all the things that might happen and all of these things start popping up in your social media about wars and rumors of wars and all of the things, don't fear. You know, if anything, go to the Lord. Bring that fear to the Lord if you do have it. But remember, all the nations are nothing as nothing before him. To whom then will you liken God? So basically, to whom can he be compared or what likeness compare with him? An idol, a craftsman casts it and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for silver chains. So when we're sarcastically kind of talking about an idol being able to compare to the Lord, well, a craftsman has to actually make an idol, whereas none of us made God. 
a goldsmith has to overlay it with gold because otherwise it's going to seem poor, which we know our God is better than any gold or silver or anything that we find value on this earth. And a casts it for silver chains because he has to hold it up. An idol has to be held up. God is the one who holds us up. So ultimately, idols are empty and worthless. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out skillful craftsmen to set up an idol that will not move. So it takes a lot of effort to be able to create this idol. And essentially it's worthless. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Because remember, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So who rules the kingdoms of the world is the big question here. And Isaiah really just can't even believe that anyone is able to doubt the greatness of God. I feel like that sometimes. Do you? Like, how can you not believe? Like, how can you not see this? We can't judge people for not being able to see it. But man, I just, I'm like, how? I don't know. I don't know how we can't see God <laughs> when his hands and his fingerprints are all over everything. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. And we've been reading about how these earthly positions really are nothing in the end. Therefore, we cannot put too much faith in leadership or government or any type of people who are above us because ultimately they cannot save us. Now, we can honor them and respect them, but... Really, what we should be doing is lifting them up in prayer. Pray that the Lord will guide them. Pray that they will have wisdom. Pray they'll have understanding. Because, you know, a lot of times when people get in those places of power, whether it's political, legal, whatever kinds of positions they are, it can lead to pride. Power is one of those things that just is never satisfied. It just always wants more. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? So basically, who can God be compared to? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. And of course, he's the Holy One, capital letters, because no one else is the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. So when you look around, do you see God? You know, I was saying, I can't believe you can't see God. But really, I mean, it's it's an opportunity for us to evaluate our own hearts. Like when we look around at creation, at situations, do we truly see God in it all? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right hand is disregarded by my God or my right is disregarded. So they are questioning where God is. Why is God so despondent or why are you so despondent rather? That is what they're asking Jacob. So this is Israel in its backslidden state when it's referred to as Jacob. So why do you have no hope? I mean, the thing is, is nothing is ever hidden from God. He always knows you're coming, you're going. He knows everything you're doing. You're rising, you're laying down. So have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. So not only does he transcend time by being the everlasting God, but he transcends space by being the creator of all space. He does not faint or grow weary. So this is speaking of his omnipotence. If you didn't know what the word omnipotent means, it means he is unlimited in power. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. So this is one of our benefits that we get to have. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary because human strength can never compare to the strength of God and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Love this. Renewing means to put on afresh, to basically give you a new pair. So he is renewing the strength of those who wait for him or wait upon him. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Now, eagles are often a symbol of strength. And of course, God is our strength. So if we are mounting up with wings like eagles, we're mounting up with wings like his. They shall run and not be weary. So this not be weary 
This is the ability for us to move forward and progress. He doesn't want us to just sit still. When we wait upon him, it's an action. We are actively worshiping, serving, loving people. We are continual in our renewal every single day of our faith. It is like a waiter who is working all shifts, like breakfast, lunch, dinner. That is the way our lives work in our faith. It's never passive. Um, it's never. It never has this like resignation spirit about it. It's always seeking him. It's always relying on him. It's having confident expectation that he is going to do something. And then they shall walk and not faint. And, you know, we have this unlimited power through this scripture, as we can see. The fact that if we wait upon him, he will always renew our strength. He will always help us to have those wings where we are able to rise up above our issues. We will be able to run ahead of whatever the trials and battles that we might be facing. We will be able to walk through them because he is walking with us through them and we will not become weary or faint. So this is all about spiritual transformation here when we decide to wait upon the Lord. And now here in chapter 41, we see a picture of sort of a courtroom here that Isaiah is depicting as all of the nations are on trial. So this is a prophecy to all nations. So listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Let the people renew their strength. So this is a divine call for silence in the courtroom, you know, and usually when there's a divine call for silence, it typically means there's judgment about to be put in place. And they were all operating, of course, on their own strength and they better come prepared to the courtroom. So he's like, you know, what? I'm gonna give them a chance to get it right, to renew their strength before they get in here and get the smack down. <laughs> Let them approach, let them speak, let us together draw near for judgment. So basically he's going to allow them to plead their case. Who stirred up one from the East whom victory meets at every step? Well, God definitely stirred up Abraham. Some scholars think that he is speaking about Abraham here who came out of the East. A lot of scholars believe that this is speaking about Cyrus, who is not a man of God. However, he's an instrument of God that ended up making an alliance with uh, Medes, 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 I don't know how you say that, Medes, Medes, and the Persians in order to defeat Babylon. So this could be what, who he's speaking of. But ultimately, we know, of course, this always points to Jesus. He gives up nations before him so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble, stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely by paths his feet have not trod. So who's in control here? We know God is in control. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. So God is basically the bookends of victory. He is not a God who operates in blind fate or happenstance or by chance or, you know, uh, uh, karma or superstition. No, he is the beginning of every journey and story. He is the end of every journey and story. He is not bound by time. So this is why I often say, I believe God hears the past and the future prayers of his children because he's not bound by time. He's the, there in the beginning. He's also there in the end. He is there in our tomorrow. You know, we're not there yet, but he is. So it's pretty powerful when you get an understanding of God not being bound by a timeline. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. They have seen his power. And this is natural for them to be afraid. I don't know if you've ever had an encounter with God and his power. I have. And it was scary to the point I was like, okay, 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 stop, 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 stop. <laughs> you know? Um, but it is a beautiful thing at the same time. I mean, it will change your life, hopefully for the better. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and come. Everyone, his neighbor, and says to his brother, be strong. So they are now turning to each other. So rather than this being life-changing for the better and them turning to God, they're actually turning away from him to their own brothers. And the craftsman strengthens the goldsmith and he who smooths with the hammer him, who strikes the anvil saying the soldering, it is good. 
So they are fooled into thinking, yeah, all is well. This is almost like sarcasm once again or a satire of the effectiveness of idols that this is speaking of. And they strengthen it with nails so that it cannot be moved. So when they see the power of God, they're afraid. And instead, they go and strengthen their idols, hoping that their idols will you take care of them. But you, O Israel, my servant. So this is, sounds like a degrading position. You know, in the world standard, you hear about a servant or a slave. It's never something that we look at as a good or high position. But for the Lord, being a servant is the highest of all positions. It's the highest of all honors in his eyes. So heart check, do you seek to be a servant? Ouch, that one stung a little bit because I'm like, man, I don't know that I do. Well, if we look at it this way, servants know their master. So if you feel like you know your God, that is one trait of a servant. They listen to their master. So do you listen to what the Lord speaks to your heart? Do you obey his commands? And do you do as he says? When he says to move, do you move? When he says to be quiet, do you be quiet? When he says, hold your tongue, do you hold your tongue? When he says, don't pick this battle with them, do you pick the battle with them? Are you listening to what he says? Jacob, whom I have chosen, so beautiful thing that even though it's Jacob in his sin, he still chooses him, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. So this is not because of who they are, but because of his greatness. He has chosen them and therefore they are able to be the servant of the Lord. Fear not, for I am with you. So this is a command and a promise. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. So the command, don't be dismayed, promise, because I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And this is a command and a promise, not only for Israel, but also for us. So if you don't have this circled, written down, highlighted, Make sure that that is something that you take note of because this is one of those seeds that we can plant and refer to often. So now we see this renewed assurance. Behold all who are incensed against you. So any nations that are against Israel shall be put to shame and confounded. So basically this is going back to that promise in Genesis 12 that I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. So now he is letting it happen. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. So essentially all of the enemies of Israel will be destroyed. For I, the Lord, your God, hold your right hand. So he gives us strength over fear, strength over doubt, strength over the enemy. That is what he is doing when he holds our right hand. It is I who say to you, O Israel, fear not. I am the one who helps you. This is very similar to what he actually spoke to Moses. Fear not, you worm Jacob. So this worm Jacob, notice that the worm is referred to with Jacob, but then we will see you men of Israel, men referred to when it is speaking of Israel governed by God and not Jacob the deceiver. So this is speaking about exiled Israel, which really is despicable at this point. So the worm is deceitful, man is redeemed. So he's speaking of both of them because they will come out as exiles. They will enter as men of God, as redeemed children. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. His redeemer, remember that a kinsman redeemer is the one in the family who would defend the family, protect the family, buy back any family members who had been sold off. Behold, I make of you a threshing sledge. So he is going to take them from being a worm to now an instrument that is able to conquer all. New, sharp, having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them, so not even a mountain will be able to stand in your way. And you shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away. And the tempest shall scatter them, and you shall rejoice in the Lord. In the Holy One of Israel shall you shall glory, because you will know that it is God who has done this for you, and it is God who helps you just as he said he would." 
Now, when the poor and the needy seek water, so the poor and the needy seeking water are the exiles moving through the desert, going back towards home, and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains on the midst of the valleys. So he is going to bring miraculous provision. He is going to meet their needs. His provision is not only going to just be this like sort of sprinkling, but it's going to be bountiful. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. And of course, this water supply will lead to the planting of trees. So they're going to go from barrenness to fruitful. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together, that they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. So this will be a symbol so that God can get the glory. And when it's again talks about his hand, that the hand of the Lord has done this, this is talking about the power and strength of God. Only by his power and strength has this been done. And so when we get things, do we give the glory back to God? So set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. And this is the title of that special relationship that he has with Israel or with Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. So basically, let your idols predict the future and let's see what happens. Tell us the former things, what they are. So why don't you tell us of the prophecy that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome or this glorious future or declare to us the things to come. And the things to come are actually the mighty acts that are going to take place as God uses Cyrus to overtake Babylon. This is the gathering of God's people and Christ's kingdom being established on the earth. So it's like, can you really idols? Can you all tell us about what is going to happen? Because God can, but the idols can't, right? Tell us what is to come hereafter. Well, we know that the idols can't tell the future. That we may know that you are God's. So this is kind of sarcastic here. Do good or do harm that we may be dismayed and terrified. Behold, you're nothing. So you have no power and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. So anyone who goes after these idols causes revulsion for God. I stirred up one from the north and he has come. So Cyrus, of course, is going to come from the north to conquer the Babylonians. And from the rising of the sun, and he shall call upon my name. He shall trample on rulers as on mortars. So he wasn't a man of God, but he does respect God. As the potter treads clay, who declared it from the beginning that we might know, and beforehand that we might say, he is right? There was none who declared it, none who proclaimed, none who heard your words. I was the first to say to Zion, behold, here they are. So they is referring to the former things and the things to come. And I give to Jerusalem a herald of good news, the herald of good news, the mouthpiece of the good news, which is Isaiah. But when I look, there is no one among these. There is no counselor who, when I ask, gives an answer. Behold, they're all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. So this is speaking of the futility of the nations that have no true understanding of the past, the present, and the future. And their idols all basically just simply blow hot air. Now in chapter 42, we see the Lord's chosen servant, which is Jesus himself. So behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. Now this is mirroring the same thing that God says about, or the Holy Spirit, when he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So when the father says about Jesus and our father delights in us the same way, you know, we don't have to try to do anything to earn his approval. He delights in us because we are his chosen ones. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. So that spirit comes upon him after he is baptized by John the Baptist. And there is a difference here. Someone has asked about this. I know I've explained it before, but I will talk about it really quickly. That there's a difference between having the spirit of God in you and the spirit of, the, of God coming upon you. So the spirit in us happens at salvation. Jesus had the spirit of God in him as he... Uh, when he was born. He, but the difference of the spirit coming upon us is the spirit 
comes upon you to empower you for service. So some people will ask me, well, how do I know if the spirit has come upon me? Well, have you asked? Have you asked for the spirit to empower you, to come upon you, to give you that go ahead, to give you what you need, to be able to go out and do his work, to do his service? It's as simple as that, as asking for the spirit to come upon you. And it does shift something in us whenever the Holy Spirit comes upon us or we are baptized in the spirit. He will bring forth justice to the nations. So he will have this universal justice. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. So he's going to come in humility and gentleness. A bruised reed he will not break. So he is not going to trample on the poor and the needy. And a faintly burning wick he will not quench. So instead of simply, you know, stopping the burning wick, he is going to fan the flame instead. So this is referring to those who might be losing hope or losing faith. He doesn't give up on them. He actually fans their flame and says, you know what? Come on, let me help you. What can I do to try to get you to start to believe? I'm going to show you some some miracles. I'm going to show you my spirit here. And God does ne- he never dismisses us if our light is dim or we are broken or we are simply just a smoking burning wick. He sees the beautiful music that can be made from a reed. He sees the wick from the flax that is able to burn oil. So he sees who we can be. He sees who he has made us to be. He knows our value. He knows exactly how he has made us and with what, with what gifts and how he is able to use us. And so that is how he sees us. So he won't trample us down when we are struggling a little bit to operate in that. He will not grow faint or be discouraged. So he's never going to get sick of you. So if you ever feel like God's sick of you, he's not. He is not sick of you. Till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. So this being the new covenant that will be made. Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. So God is the source of all spiritual and physical life. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and I will keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people. This is the everlasting covenant. This is the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth so that he could establish that everlasting covenant with us. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nation. So of course, Jesus being the light of the world. So he frees us from spiritual darkness. He frees us from death to open the eyes that are blind So this is restoration and healing to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and set people free who have been held captive of their sin from the prison. Those who sit in darkness. These are all promises given to us when we receive Jesus. He gives us breath. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He calls us in righteousness. He takes us by the hand. He keeps us. He gives us a covenant. He makes us a light of the nations, a light of the world. He opens the eyes of the blind. He lets those scales fall off. He brings us out from captivity and sets us free and allows us to walk in freedom. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory, I give no other. So what grace that God would even reveal his name to us. You know, at one time, the name of God was so sacred that if it, you know, it was only spoken by the high priest once a year, That is why it is spelled Y-H-W-H. We don't even know the pronunciation of it. We think it's Yahweh. We think it might be Jehovah. Not sure. But what grace. He says, I am the Lord and that is my name. And he will not give his glory to another. Now, this is not him being pompous and prideful, being like, I share my glory. That's not his attitude. He's simply saying, I cannot give my glory to another because no one else can fulfill the way that I can. Everyone else will simply be a false hope. And God is all of the hope that we need. You know, he is the hope of all nations. So he knows that no one else will be able to do that. That is why he cannot simply share his glory. But the quickest way to undo what God has been doing in your life is to try to get that glory, is to try to take credit for it. That's exactly what Lucifer did. He was trying to get the glory of God before he fell. Nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass. 
And new things I now declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So this is speaking about the old prophecy that was spoken has now happened and new prophecy is now being spoken. So he once came as a sacrificial lamb. He is now going to come back as a lion of Judah. That is an example of the old and the new for us in this day. He's going to come as a conquering king where he came as a humble baby in a manger before. So he's the same God, though. He's the God of the past, the present, and he's also the God of the future. Same God, but different characteristics. So the old versus the new. Sing to the Lord a new song. So, of course, this will be the natural response to uh, who he is and what he does. We, When we start to understand who he is and the powerful things that he does, it is a natural response to praise him. His praise from the ends of the earth. So all people, you who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants, let the desert and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants or the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. The Lord goes out like a mighty man or like a mighty warrior, Jehovah Nisi. Like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out, he shouts aloud, he shows himself mighty against his foes. So here we see the new coming of Jesus. His first coming once again was meek, it was lowly, but his triumphant return, it'll be loud, it's going to be powerful. And when he says he shows himself mighty against his foes, plain and simple, he will win. For a long time I've held my peace. So this was his patient delay in action or judgment. I have kept still and restrained myself. And this is kind of why we never really need to worry about the current state of the world because he is going to make it all right. You know, we don't need to try to seek total fulfillment or complete happiness. It's merely impossible because nothing is ever truly right on this earth until Jesus gets here. So there will always be something that is poking at us, but he is going to cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. So when he says now, this is speaking of that new age restoration that is going to take place. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. So nothing is going to be able to get in his way. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind, which is Israel, in a way that they do not know, in paths that they have not known. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. So hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see, because the people of Israel were failing to listen and failing to see. They refused. So this is declaring that the exile that Israel experienced as punishment is justified. Who is blind but my servant, or Israel, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but he does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. And of course, God's word or his law always displays his holy standard. But this is a people plundered and looted, of course, by Assyria and Babylon. They are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons. They have become plunder with none to rescue, spoil with none to say, restore. So the devil is wreaking havoc, wreaking, you know, wrecking house, and yet no one is crying restore in the end. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will attend and listen for time to come? Who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned and whose ways they would not walk and whose law they would not obey? So, of course, he was gentle with them in the way that he spoke to them, but now he's going to be a little bit sharper. So he poured on him the heat of his anger and the might of the battle. It set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. So even though he is becoming a little bit harsher on them, it still isn't working. This purifying fire is not doing any good for those who have these hardened hearts. And chapter 43, Israel's only savior, but now thus says the Lord. And the fact that Isaiah is saying, 
says the Lord. This is declaring that God is the author of this prophecy and not simply Isaiah. He who treated you or created you, excuse me, O Jacob, or fashioned anew, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. So basically, you are twice owned now. And this is, again, declaring that intimate relationship that he has by saying, I've called you, and you are mine. So it is speaking of God as their creator, but also as their redeemer. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. So this is a reference to what he did in the Red Sea and in the waters of the Jordan. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. Of course, if God is for us, who can be against us? So we can walk through the fire and not get burned. And the flame shall not consume you. So this alone, these, these verses here, prove God's word to be true. And if you are ever going to ask the question, well, give me some proof that the word of God is true. We can simply say, look at the Jews, because they went without having a country for more than 2000 years, yet they were able to maintain their culture, their language, their identity, their heritage, and ultimately their religion and their faith. So that in itself just goes to show that God is doing something powerful with the remnant of those who are left. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes. So this is his why. Why does he do all this? Because they are precious to him. And this is because of his grace. And honored, and I love you. Oh, that makes me want to cry. I give men in return for you and peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. So this is declaring that God will gather his people and everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And guess what? We are. We are called. We are created for his glory. And we are also formed and made by him and for him. And therefore, we will be the people he is also going to gather. So bring out the people who are blind, yet have eyes, who are deaf, yet have ears. These are the ones who have not fulfilled this restoration prophecy here. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them go ahead and bring their witnesses to prove them right or simply prove me wrong. And let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. They are supposed to be witnesses of his great works. If they only remembered his great works, that was the problem. They would forget. And my servant whom I have chosen. So they're not only witnesses, but also the servant of the Lord. That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord. And besides me there is no Savior, plain and simple. I declared and I saved and I proclaimed when there was no strange God among you. So notice that he didn't speak until there was no strange God among them. And so if there are ever times where we feel like we cannot see or hear God, you might want to ask yourself, is there a strange God among me? Is there some sort of idol in my life that I need to get rid of so that I can hear the voice of God once again? Also, henceforth, I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work and who can turn it back? Well, if all of the idols are dead and worthless, well, God is the living God. Therefore, he is able to do all of the things that he says he can do and all of the things that idols cannot do. So this is sort of like the celebration of God's sovereignty here. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the one who defends you, protects you and buys you back for your sake, I send to Babylon. So this is prophetic now because, of course, it hasn't actually happened when Isaiah was speaking this. So he sends Babylon and brings them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans and the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. So again, referring back to that intimate relationship and the fact that he not only has this relationship with them, but he also still rules over them. So he's still sovereign. 
Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, of course the Red Sea he did, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. So the Medes and Persians are going to come by the way of the Euphrates, the way that the Babylonians did. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. So don't focus on what was. Don't focus on the judgment. And this is the same for us. He still calls us to this same commandment. Don't focus on your past failures. You know, God is a God who looks ahead. Satan looks backwards. So don't stay stuck in your past. We've got to move forward. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? So this is speaking of restoration. And this is why I said this, this was a really important uh, book and chapter in my life at one point still is because I always come back to this and behold, I know God is doing a new thing in me daily. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So he's going to have this unobstructed route ready for the Israelites to return. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. And you know, when God leads us into a new thing, are we able to then trust him to make a way in the wilderness? Do we trust him to give us the details, to give us the resources that we're going to need? Well, if God is the way maker and we declare that, I hope that the answer is yes, I trust him to make a way in the wilderness. Yet you did not call upon me, O Jacob, so mm, you're guilty, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. So basically they're like, you know what? I need a break. I need a break from you, God, from all this stuff that you're doing. But we should never feel that way because the yoke is easy and the burden is light with Jesus. If we ever feel like we are being burdened by God, then something isn't quite right. I don't know if that means we're trying to strive to earn his approval. We're trying to do these works so that we're hoping we'll get his attention. That could essentially lead to weariness. But really, we should not be weary with the Lord because He is the restorer. He's the one who brings that joy. He gives us strength. He is our peace. So we definitely shouldn't be feeling that way, but we do sometimes, you know, sometimes when I'm reading through long chapters like this, I start to feel a little weary, but I'm like, Lord, help me. Give me that strength. So here's what he's saying has happened. When you get weary, this is what can happen if you let yourself stay in that weariness. You've not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. So basically, we can um, not worship the way that God calls us to worship. That's what was happening with Israel. They were not doing it as he prescribed. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. You have not bought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you've burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. So if you just think about it, like, man, Can you imagine how God feels with all of the sin that we burden him with? So again, when we're weary, our giving will wane. We will stop being as giving of our time, of our spirit, of our talent, of our treasure. We will then turn to insincere worship or we will become ungrateful. And that was what was happening here. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. There are so many things I simply don't want to remember about my past life. Definitely don't want God remembering it. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. So present your best case before me. Your first father sinned, meaning Adam. It's innate. We are born into sin nature. So therefore, we can look at this as a good thing because we no longer have to strive to try to get God's favor, to try to get his forgiveness because we have that through the blood of Jesus. And your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and deliver Jacob to utter destruction, meaning the curse is going to come upon him and Israel to reviling or this strong criticism that will be spoken against them. So whew, this was a lot, but I love how we are able to see those tidbits of the promises of God 
and Jesus and what he does for us and just this renewal of the promise of the new covenant that we have with him. I hope that you're grateful for that. What was it in this? Because there has got to be something that struck your heart, struck a chord. What was it? Can you let us know in the comments? I, I find that if we can encourage each other with the way that God is speaking to us, it will open up the hearts for so many other people to say, ah, okay, yeah, maybe I didn't hear God in the moment, but now that you say that, you, you know, now that I think about it, that was something that spoke to my heart because remember his whisper is gentle. So sometimes we may not catch it the first time, but if someone reminds us, we can then say, oh, you know what? I did hear that in my spirit. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came you died and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.